Well, to help our audience to understand your work, I think we're going to talk about something more specific from the um, advanced nutrient therapy perspective, from the mechanism behind the modalities. Um, So I'm going to just go through a a common uh, conditions that people are suffering from and just get your summary of what the advanced nutrient therapy would provide and why. And let's start with, of course, the depression first. And what would you tell people who suffer from depression and um, uh, what is available for them from the nutritional perspective? Well, there's a few things, parts that we've learned even quite recently. Depression generally has a genetic predisposition where some people are born with this tendency. In others, um, however, most people with depression, uh, it has an onset where it suddenly gets worse either in teenage years or later. And the, and the question is what happened? We're now learning this has a lot to do with loss of DNA integrity and, and it changes that can be permanent in which uh, your, your, some of your key neurotransmitters are misbehaving. And um, we've learned that we have the ability with nutrients to adjust the, the uh, genetic expression of, of, of misbe- misbehaving genes that can adjust neurotransmission. In other words, most people with uh, clinical depression, uh, I'd say the majority probably have an un- what we call undermethylated version of it. And we're learning that has to do with undermethylation of their DNA their global DNA uh, during the nine months of uh, gestation, that when the baby is born, they don't have these regulating methyl marks in the right places. And and so when we diagnose a patient with undermethylation, that we already know it's very likely they have diminished or insufficient uh, activity at serotonin receptors. And recently we now know they have too much activity at NMDA receptors. And so that, that's one expression. We've also learned that depression is a name given to, I call it an umbrella term. And it's an tr- expression given to at least five completely different conditions. I presented this at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. I thought they might throw me out, but they didn't. They were nice to me. And I had this huge group of psychiatrists and I basically was explaining that they were doing the d- depression all wrong. And that, and that uh, I had this huge, probably the world's biggest chemistry database for depression. And it was very clear that there are completely different diseases now called depression. And as you know, uh, for example, some of them simply have uh, a metal metabolism disorder involving extraordinary inability to keep copper levels regulated. Copper levels have a lot to do with dopamine and norepinephrine. It has a massive effect if it's not regulated. That's 17% of all people with depression. And then there are other types. There are what we call the pyrrole depressants. And these are people born with extraordinary oxidative overload. And it's inborn. We now understand why people have this condition. It has to do with genetic weakness in the natural antioxidant protectors that we have. A lot of people have weakness in that. And also weakness in DNA repair. They can't protect their DNA. We're learning more and more that that conditions like depression, schizophrenia and all are related to primarily to loss of DNA integrity, which is why we age. It's also why the basic reason why people develop these disorders. But we do have, uh, we've now been able to, for depression, a patient, a depressed patient comes to a psychiatrist, typically in the world, they spend their half an hour wondering, I wonder what medication I can give them. But we now have, uh, since I gave that talk at the APA, uh, we now, uh, the most enthusiastic doctors we have are psychiatrists. And there are more and more and more of them want to learn how to do this. So then when the first time they see a patient, they'll do some lab tests and they'll find out whether they have imbalances in metal metabolism, whether they have a methylation imbalances, whether they have a pyrrole problem, Etc. And that can tell them, that can guide them to nutrient therapy that can really help them. It also can guide them to which medication to give them. 
So it's, it's more scientific. And I think this is going to grow and grow. And that's why we're trying to uh, give this information to uh, as many doctors around the world as we can. And uh, it's, it's going well. Great. A specific question regarding medication selections. Let's say people who are on the methylated supposedly having lower serotonin level. And, yes. um, and do they also have a dopamine or, or lobelephrin deficiency as well? Yes, in general. And there are exceptions. But usually, 90-95% of the time, if a person has low serotonin activity, they tend to have low dopamine activity. And the reason is it's controlled by reuptake, not the amount of dopamine or serotonin in the body, but really the rate at which the neurotransmitters in a synapse can go, immediately go back to the original neuron. And um, reuptake is, is controlled by, by for, for, for um, serotonin, that's uh, controlled by a gene called a CERT gene, S-E-R-T, serotonin transporter program. And, that, and that's what produces the passageways at the neurons for the serotonin to go back into the original cell to reuptake. And uh, we can control that. We can regulate that by changing methylation status. And so if, um, if a person's under-methylated, we almost certainly know that they also have symptoms and traits associated with that. It's not because their body's methylation is under-methylated. It's because of their DNA methylation. I call it global DNA methylation. If their DNA has low methylation, if they're undermethylated, then they will be, they will tend to be competitive, they'll be perfectionistic, they'll be prone to OCD, they'll be prone to addictions, they'll and they'll have these classic traits. Um, and, and that's why when we when we treat methylation, people who have these traits, they still have those same traits after we normalize the methylation in the body. It's because it's it's, it's controlled by their their methyl bookmarks on their DNA, and they don't change. So that's why those things tend to be the same. So we're learning a lot about how to help people. And um, so for, for depression, now got the five major types of depression, and we got individual therapies for them, nutrient therapies, and recommendations of what medications. If a person is undermethylated by our diagnosis, and, and if they have low serotonin activity, that means we don't want to give them a medication that's going to reduce serotonin activity. A good example is, is dopamine. Some people have problems with too much dopamine activity or too little. Uh, one group that tends to have a lot of excessive dopamine activity are schizophrenics, classic paranoid schizophrenics, especially the ones who are tormented by hearing voices, who have a, a sensory disorder where their, their senses fail them. And um, they... And, and so now throughout the world, a person is diagnosed with schizophrenia, the treatment of choice usually is to give them a drug that will lower dopamine activity based on the dopamine theory of schizophrenia. And, and uh, so what works really well are folates and B3 niacin because they, they tend to drop dopamine activity. Problem is they also drop serotonin activity. <laughs> so you have to be careful. So we can just knowing their basic methylation status, we can, we can identify medications that are promising and not promising. For example, benzodiazepines, and they're, they're, they have problems with addiction tendencies, but uh, they work especially good for overmethylated people. And they tend to harm undermethylated people. And there's a lot of both groups you need to know. So we can really assist psychiatrists in identifying which medications. Uh, whenever we have a patient who comes to you first time and they're, and they're taking medications, drug medications, they don't call them biologics. I guess that's a more comforting name for, <laughs> for, for um, publicity reasons, but they often can't wait to get rid of their medications. And we say, no, no, you must continue the medication and do both treatments together because our nutrient therapies often take two, three, four or five months to really get the full benefit. And then after you've done both together and provided that the patient has dramatically improved, then only then you start cautiously lowering the drugs. We are not opposed to drugs, drug medications. They've helped millions of people. I've had hundreds of people tell me how drugs have, have saved them and helped them. So we're not at all against them. However, 
uh, it would be nice to use as little of it as necessary because they have side effects and other problems. <laughs>